U.S. Naval Institute, along with my counterpart at FCA International, Mr. Ken Schneider, I welcome you to West 2013. I'd ask everybody to please rise for the presentation of the colors and the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. Retire the colors. I'd like to thank the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps for this presentation this morning. Let's give them some recognition. Please be seated. Before I introduce this morning's uh, first keynote speaker, I have a few things I'd wish to highlight for the uh, coming conference. First, that we have a dynamic set of panel sessions that will occur throughout the program, and those will be up above, up on the next deck for you naval types, in room six alpha. The cyber theater, the engagement theater, and the small business theater will host sessions throughout the week in a more intimate session setting that will allow for better questioning and more close one-to-one -one interaction. For the first time in this conference, we're having a cyber training track at West, and those sessions will be taking place, again, up above in room two. Sessions in the cyber theater, the cyber training track, the engagement theater, as well as other AFSIA professional events are eligible for continuing education unit credit, and I encourage all of our attendees to take advantage. Also this week, taking place on the exhibit floor is Plug Fest. Plug Fest is a process that allows government, industry, and academic organizations to collaborate to assess and clarify a military problem rapidly, deliver a set of military compliant, standards-based plug and play components, and showcase application prototypes to solve challenging problems. The competition this week is centered on an HA DR scenario, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, which will be competi a competition between three teams. Two of those teams come from industry, one from academia, and they'll demonstrate their solutions in the PlugFest theater. PlugFest winners will be announced on Thursday, and we invite you to visit the booth, booth 2400, in the exhibit hall to see what may be the future for rapid acquisition. You may follow the West Conference via Twitter, hashtag West13. Plus, you can monitor daily on-scene reports on the FCA website, on the U.S. Naval Institute website, and also via YouTube Naval Institute and the U.S. Naval Institute app. We've built time into the schedule this week to allow interaction on the floor. There's lots of time, there's lots of time built in to check out the technology that's showcased with all our exhibitors, and we hope that you take advantage of that. Please engage the people on the floor. There's a lot of solutions out there, 
And I always find when you hit several of these exhibits, you always learn something you just didn't know before that you needed to know. As a reminder, on Thursday, we're going to have, and we're very lucky to have, all three of the Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard chiefs here with us on stage in a town hall format. And we're going to take questions through the next two and a half days. And you can submit those questions on askmewest at gmail.com. And we'll flash that up during the conference during the break. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today. He's a naval aviator. He's a Tomcat pilot. He's commanded at the squadron, ship, group, and fleet level. He served as commanding officer of the USS Enterprise. In the immediate aftermath of 911, Enterprise was on station first and doing and delivering combat effects in the first days of Operation Enduring Freedom off Afghanistan. He also subsequently was the commander of the Theodore Roosevelt Strike Group and was Commander Six Fleet. More recently, after serving as Commander Northern Command, he became the ninth Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We're very fortunate to have the person who may be, of all people, the closest to the genesis of the very strategy that's the theme of our conference. Admiral Sandy Winnefeld is the guy, and there's no better person to be with us here today. He's the last person on active duty that I know who's credited in the movie Top Gun. <laughs> I give you Sandy Winnefeld. Good morning, everyone. So many uh, colleagues and former colleagues and friends. I don't think there are any former friends out there. OK, that was a test to see if you're awake. Uh, truly, it's really a delight for me to be here. And thank you, Pete. And thanks to the entire team at the Naval Institute and to Ken Schneider and AFSIA for arranging this conference. I've very much been looking forward to, to being out here. I want to thank all of the week's sponsors uh, for putting together such an important forum and in such a fantastic location. It really is great for me to be back in San Diego, standing on the shores of the mighty Pacific Ocean in my hometown, returning to the birthplace of naval aviation, enjoying um, the salt air and a reunion with the harbor where I grew up learning how to sail, and enjoying the hospitality and the camaraderie of the Naval Institute of which I've been a proud member for over 39 years. Under Secretary Bob Work, who I think is speaking to you later, and I almost didn't make it to San Diego this week because of the department's prohibition on non-essential travel due to the ongoing budget crisis. But we got together and made a policy decision that because we can do a better job of scaring you if we're out here in person, that it probably made this truly mission essential. It looks like a very uh, relevant, a terrific program this week. Uh, budget challenges, innovation, how we keep our best people in the service, cybersecurity, and of course the rebalance to the Pacific. Many of you in this audience are stakeholders in how we as a nation resource our defense and security, which is why I think it's so important that I have the opportunity to talk to you. And I will talk a little bit about that, including a little bit about ends, ways, and means. And then I'll talk a little bit about our rebalance to the Pacific. And because it feels so good to be out of Washington, I hope you don't mind that I gave my dress blues a little bit of a break today. <clears throat> As most of you know, we in the department are rocketing down uh, the budget trail in our little Department of Defense sled with the three hungry wolves of debt limit, continuing resolution, and sequester bearing down upon us. With the pending approval, we think, of a three-month debt limit extension, this wolf seems to have moved to the end of the line. It's now last in line. Because the continuing resolution doesn't expire until the 27th of March, the government shutdown wolf is only next in line in front of the uh, 
the, the uh, debt limit wolf. That leaves the March 1 sequestration wolf as the one closest to the sled. And it's becoming increasingly apparent that that wolf is going to catch us. And I would say that in the worst case, the continuing resolution wolf and the sequestration wolf will both catch us and gobble up much of our poor little sled. That will leave us executing FY13 at FY12 budget levels with another $500 billion in reductions over the next 10 years on top of the $487 billion we've already taken that was crafted by both houses of Congress and enacted into law by the President, on top of the $300 billion in efficiencies that Secretary Gates found during the latter part of his tenure. I know of no other time in history when we have come potentially down this far, this fast in the defense budget. And in the best case, none of those wolves will actually catch us. But we're going to have to jettison a little cargo over the side in order to keep them all at bay. That might consist of Congress passing a budget deal that takes more out of discretionary spending, including an unknown amount out of defense. So we find ourselves with only one thing that we can really be sure of, and that is that our world is about to change. We're going to have less money. We just don't know how much less, or when we're going to find out how much less, or even what the rules are going to be. Of course, I think you'd agree that that's no way to run a business, but it's the way we are, what we are right now, and we're working through it as best we can. And that means that your world is about to change. Now, you might think that Chairman Dempsey and I are, are very worried about the military getting smaller. And indeed we are, because there are an awful lot of ends out there in this world that your United States military is being asked to accomplish. But we also recognize and acknowledge that the, there is a national security imperative of deficit reduction. And we're all going to have to row together in the government uh, together to go ahead and try to fix that problem. It's important to remember that no truly powerful nation has ever had a weak economy. So we're going to have to rebalance our ends and our ways and our strategy with fewer means. And that's what strategy is really all about. And we know how to do this, although it can be pretty hard, but it could be a lot harder coming up under some of the budget scenarios that, we're, that are facing us. But I'll tell you, the chairman and I are probably a little bit more worried about something else. And that's because if sequester does occur, a lot of people are about to come to grips with cutting an, at what cutting an average of $20 billion out of each state's economy over the next 10 years really means in their home states and in their hometowns. And because of that, we could be asked to do some of these reductions in an out-of-balance way. We're worried that we will either not be allowed to get smaller and we'll have to take all this money out of readiness, which is a direct path to hollowness, which I will speak to later, or we'll be allowed to get smaller, but only through a series of politically driven choices rather than through the real national security needs of the country. So I'd like to give you a little insight today into what's going to inform the chairman's and my recommendations to the secretary and beyond. And it all starts with getting the ends right and allowing them to influence everything that we do. The ends, of course, are our national security interests. And we need to begin using those more as a fundamental basis for our decision making. And that's exactly what we're doing. Now, you're probably thinking, well, why don't we always do it this way? Don't we always keep our national security interests in mind? Well, we should, but they aren't always at the forefront of the decision making process. When you have a lot of money, you can look at problems such as the use of force or allocation of risk or resource allocation in stovepipes. And every problem viewed in a stovepipe looks like the most important problem around and definitely needs to be funded. But when you don't have a lot of money, you can't live that way. You have to make harder choices. So Marty and I are increasingly turning to an articulation of those national security interests as sort of a unified theor field theory uh, to guide our recommendations to the secretary and the president on those three very important things. And that is when and how to use force, how to allocate risk and how to allocate the precious resources that the taxpayers give to us to provide for our national security. Now, the chairman derived these six interests 
from the enduring national interests that are described in the national security strategy. And they are, in priority order, the survival of the nation, the security of the global economic system, the prevention of catastrophic attacks on our nation, secure, confident, and reliable allies and partners, protection of American citizens abroad, and protection and, where possible, extension of universal values. We use this list every day. Regarding the use of force, the higher a threatened interest lies on that hierarchy, the more likely we are to use force pr to protect it, and the more likely we are to do so unilaterally, and the more likely we are to expend resources and take risk, like putting boots on the ground, in order to do it. And the reverse is true. No matter how decisions on using force recently have actually been made, I can explain every one of those decisions within that prioritized framework. Regarding risk, the higher the likelihood and consequence of a threat to one of those interests, and the lower our ability to counter it, then the higher level of strategic risk we will assign to that interest, and the higher it will move up on the food chain of what gets resourced. And regarding resource allocation, I can say that as a rule, if you have a thing that you want to buy or keep as a service, or that you want to sell or maintain as a supplier, where more of those national security interests are serviced by your thing, and the higher those interests rank on the list, the more likely your thing will be a winner. And the reverse is true. So here's an important safety tip. Deputy Secretary Carter, who's a fantastic partner, and I work very closely together on the tougher decisions made by the department. And I'm using our six national security interests as one of the major filters to inform every single recommendation I make in the requirements and budgeting process. It helps me find the losers and the winners, the platforms and technologies we need today, and that will be the game changers that we need tomorrow. Now, as vice chairman, I get to spend a lot, a large portion of my time dealing with our investment priorities in our portfolios. Through the JROC, I largely own the requirements process, and I work with a, a very closely with a set of key partners on the budget portfolio, and I help wherever possible on the acquisition portfolio. And I've got a set of great partners that I work through those processes with. We've made a number of improvements to the requirements process in the past year or so building on the progress made by my predecessor. We're looking at capabilities in portfolios more than we ever have, which is driving us away from every little problem having its own solution, and we can find savings there. We're accounting more for technical maturity and cost versus capability in our decisions, as the Congress has asked us to do. We're willing to be flexible downward on requirements if it makes sense during the acquisition process and help us find a better knee in the curve. And we're very wary right now of upward pressure on requirements because of the disruptive nature that upward pressure uh, can cause. We're doing internally what we can to, do dr to drive efficiencies, including shrinking our initial capability documents from 300-page contractor-written behemoths to 10 pages written by warfighters. But there's much more work to do. We've got to find more commonality across the services and across missions if we can. If one service can buy a platform that does 85% of what it needs it to do, and it will do a different 85% for a different service, then we might just save the taxpayers a whole lot of money by making perfect the enemy of good enough. If one platform can perform several missions well, or as I mentioned earlier, service more than just one of our national security interests, then it too will have an advantage especially in a, a very uh, tense budge budget environment. In short, in the requirements business, we're trying to produce relevant, achievable, agile requirements, all the while while keeping our eye on how those requirements service our national security interests. I would use as an example the Navy's U-Class program, which previously seemed to be on track to provide one orbit's worth of high-end capability for a whole lot of money. And I know that industry was deeply frustrated over the instability in the requirements that we have for that system. We're now looking 
at fitting it into the right niche inside the whole portfolio of what unmanned aircraft do in terms of performance, capability, survivability, and basing. We intend to end up with a, lower, a larger number, actually, of lower-end, long-range platforms carrying a variety of highly agile payloads that are common to other platforms and which support a number of missions and that support our efforts across the range of our national interests. I'm very optimistic about this program because we've finally stabilized the requirement industry is off and running, and I think we're going to be able to keep it on track if we can keep the money on track. I'd use another example of what's likely to be an increasing need to conduct counterterrorism operations in places where convenient land bases are just not available. And that's why we're investing in things like the Afloat Forward Staging Base, which, again, if we can keep the money stable, will be built right here in San Diego. Finally, our increasing investment in cyber, one of the very few areas that will actually increase in a, an environment where the budget's declining, and I know is one of your topics this week, is another example of where national security interests play a very strong role. Several of our high to mid-range national security interests on that list are directly affected by the potential cyber threats that are out there today, including, most notably, the security of the global economic system and prevention of catastrophic attacks on our nation. So we're going to make sure that we're there doing our part in the larger government enterprise to protect against these threats. As you know, it's an extremely complex business. Cyber is where the previously nice, clean dividing lines between civil and military, near and far, war and peace, private and public, are fading away, and we're determined to make sure we make the proper investments so that we can be competitive in that environment. Now, I spend a lot less time on the acquisition side, but I do spend time there, and my friend Frank Kendall, the chief of acquisition for the Pentagon, and I both believe that industry is, in effect, part of our total force. It's part of our structure, and it's very important that the health of that industry is important to us and will be very carefully considered as we experience these budget cuts. We can have a hollow force in many ways, training, maintenance, loss of enablers, but also by failing to invest in modernization and the technology that we will need for the future. We're trying to decide what to keep and what goes, and in addition to the national security interests, we're going to have to look at program cost, schedule, and performance to find out who the winners and the losers are. The suppliers who gain the advantage in this environment will be the ones who clearly demonstrate that they can deliver on time, that they can deliver things that work. And I would say, since I mentioned cyber a moment ago, as an aside, who protect their networks from exfiltration of sensitive information, because we will stop working with people who don't. And the winning suppliers will be those who are able to do more than just hold the line on cost. They will attack it. The ones who gain the advantage will be those who strive for transparent partnerships, in which we're able to share cost data and fee structures and information that will help us better understand industrial-based vulnerabilities, that build partnerships, that build trust, so we can figure out how to afford to buy things in an extremely austere environment. And the reverse is true. Now, one of the ways that, that Frank Kendall and I and the entire department believe we'll be able to mitigate some of the challenges of an austere fiscal environment is to capitalize on innovation. There's a tremendous amount of innovative potential energy in our various indus institutions within the military and within industry, and in my experience, a good chunk of it is on the front lines. So we need to do a better job of going out and grabbing that, even as we work very closely with industry on innovative technologies and concepts. So I'd be interested in any feedback from your panel this week on how we might do a better job of tapping in to innovation. Organizations like Special Operations Command, which both foster innovation and have the means to deliver it, are an excellent model for us. Now, there's plenty of room for innovation within the Navy and Marine Corps, across the board. At the strategic level, perhaps how we can prevail in an anti-access fight. And I don't mean by doing more of the same things in the same way or a better way. I mean doing things in a completely different way. At the operational level, how we can do a much better job with maritime domain awareness and in melding our joint air pictures. At the tactical level, 
how we use the LCS well beyond its three originally envisioned roles, and how industry can come up with a way of making inexpensive, highly adaptable electronics pods for our UAV fleet. One of the most important areas for innovation lies in the fact that nearly everything we do today has become so comfortably dependent on a vast system of networks. Networks that are deeply reliant on communications and satellites and forget precision navigation and timing. And we've enjoyed unfettered access to all of that over the last decade while our dependency has blossomed. In short, we've gotten very good at something that is very fragile. Yet there can be no doubt that anyone more sophisticated than a terrorist will understand that they need to try to take those things away from us if they're going to win a fight. There's room for both technical and tactical innovation in this area, and it's something that FCA members should relish, because we're going to have to learn to either fight through this or to live without it. There's so much more, and it's deeply important that we foster innovation, for it's so easy to become complacent when you're the best and when you're ahead of everybody else. So bring it on. I want to hear it. And I look forward to seeing some good innovation as I walk the floor uh, after my remarks this morning. And the Naval Institute and FCA didn't ask me to say that. I really actually do look forward to walking the floor and seeing what it is you guys are up to out there in industry. We're also going to have to be innovative in our approach to readiness, finding new ways to achieve it at lower cost. But all the readiness innovation in the world simply can't counter the fact that our budget challenges are going to present very serious challenges to readiness. The chairman, the service chiefs, and I are so worried about it that we recently signed a 28-star letter to Congress on readiness, and we don't sign 28-star letters very often. Under the current budget uncertainty and mechanism for potential cuts, including the fact that the CR is not necessarily balanced properly in terms of its funding bins, we are at serious risk of rapidly sliding into a hollow force. Now, the hollow force is often seen as a pejorative term, but I don't mean it that way. It's just where we're headed if we don't get this right. And as a result, you're probably hearing of steps the services are taking and are planning to take in order to account for the fact that the clock is all run already running this year and that they want to minimize the damage done by all this uncertainty over their future budgets. It's all true. Part of our challenge is that we can't spread readiness cuts like peanut butter. We have to keep units deploying to our current fight in Afghanistan and for certain other missions, such as strategic deterrence, at the very sharpest possible edge of readiness. So that means the rest of our units will be disproportionately affected. I know how it feels. I had to shut down my F-14 squadron for three months back in 1994 when we went through a similar budget crisis. We had to work very hard at the end of that three months to get our readiness back, and it's something I don't want our force to have to go through again. But as it stands, Army Brigade combat teams, as one example, are looking to lose at least 30% of their readiness capability this year. And you can't deploy like that. This means that we'll only be able to cover the conflicts that we're in and respond to the highest of the high national security interests. There could be, for, for the first time in my career, instances where we may be asked to respond to a crisis and we will have to say that we cannot. Now, it may, be initially, it may initially seem like we're crying wolf on this because carriers will still deploy here in the near future. We may not see the global impact of this until late this year or early next year because the forces deploying the soonest are already ready. They have been prepared and they can go. But there are many forces that will not be able to start their training now and therefore, they will be sidelined, grounded, tied to the pier, and they will not be able to deploy if we don't have the proper resources to make them ready to go. But we will see the domestic impact here in the very near future. If you have not already, you will soon be hearing about potential cancellation of maintenance availabilities for ships, potentially 30 this year, reductions at aviation depots, layoffs of 46,000 temporary DOD employees, a hiring freeze, you know, we hire about 2,000 people a week in DOD. And we may soon announce furloughs that could affect the vast majority of our 800,000 DOD civilians, among other measures that we will need to take soon if we don't solve this problem. I would point out that the furloughs, which we really do not want to have to do, 
amount to only one-ninth of solving the problem that we will have if sequestration does not go away. It's a $5 billion fix to a $46 billion problem. So we're working our way through what that other eight-ninths is, and we hope to have our answers here in the next few weeks. But I can tell you that if our readiness drops, then we can't be out there in the real world doing the things to protect our national security interests to keep our nation safe. And that brings me to the theme of this week's conference, namely our rebalance to the very important part of the real world, namely the Pacific right out here. I say rebalance because the term pivot is both overused and incorrect, because it implies that we would turn completely away from other regions. Moreover, the term pivot implies something happening very quickly, but it's gonna take time to rebalance as there are other more deeply troubled regions demanding our attention at the moment. But we're serious about doing this, and the Navy and Marine Corps are a huge part of the program and are already doing this. Rebalancing our efforts to the Pacific makes complete sense in the context of the national security interests I described a few minutes ago, because the Pacific region has a great deal of importance to all six of them. And if you examine those interests clo closely, it becomes clear that this rebalance is not only about competition and cooperation with China. As Exhibit A, I would mention North Korea's continued defiance of the international community's intent that they not deliver or develop deliverable weapons of mass destruction, weapons which, if fielded, can enable catastrophic atta attacks on our nation and on our partner nations. I also want to point out that our rebalance to the Pacific is not only about the visible presence of more U.S. forces in the Western Pacific. It's much more than that oversimplified metric. It also involves strengthened partnerships that improve interoperability, capabilities, access, and trust. It's also about our own capability investments, speaking to new operational concepts. Candidly, I'm less and less interested in spending lots and lots of money preparing for an in-your-face anti-access fight against an adversary that knows he needs to prepare for that, and I'm more and more interested in investing in the things a potential threat simply can't do anything about. And finally, our rebalance involves new approaches to operational planning, in which we're working to be more creative in examining objectives and assumptions and ways and means of getting the job done. I can't say much more than that, but thanks to the great leadership out here in the Pacific, from Admiral Sam Locklear and his component commanders and other subordinates, we have a good leg, leg up on this problem. Now, you may be wondering what happens to the rebalance if we experience a major budget cut. To be sure, it will be more challenging, but you can expect us to protect it as best we can, and please remember that some of the more important elements of our rebalance are actually not that costly. Now, I'd like to close by mentioning that a good bit of the narrative surrounding this rebalance has to do with the perception that America is in decline. I recall a meeting a few years ago in which former Secretary Gates was asked about this, and he laughed out loud and talked about his many years of service and what life was like in the 1970s with double-digit inflation, double-digit in interest rates, double-digit in unemployment, and a post-Vietnam War funk and how things are so much different now and how resilient we are as a nation. Indeed, we are still by far the largest economy in the world, and there are signs it's improving. We should not linearly extrapolate the economic trajectory of those against whom we're being compared. We're being blessed by the most innovative culture in the world, some of it right here in this room. We have advantages in geography and demographics and values and resources, and growing advantages in energy independence. And we have a very solid, strong set of allies and partners around the world. There are far more people clamoring to get into this country than there are into any other country in the world, and not many are asking to leave. And we have, by far and away, the finest military in the world, including the finest Navy and Marine Corps in the world. In the current strategic and budgetary environment and reaching all the way back to the national security interests I described earlier and that are the foundation of our thinking, the Navy and Marine Corps have a very strong role to play. I like the way their leadership from top to bottom 
is approaching the problems we face, and despite all the looming potential for fiscal new, bad fiscal news, we have the best group of service chiefs leading the most amazing group of flag and general officers and young men and women across the force, the most amazing group I've ever seen in my four years in the military. So thank you for your support for the military in whatever form your help might take and for your continued support for our young men and women who are doing such a fantastic job out there all across the globe today. And to any of those young men and women in uniform who are here, and I see a whole bunch of you out there, thank you for your service and thank you for your family's service. Again, it's great to be here today in San Diego. Thanks again to AFSIA and the Naval Institute for putting this terrific event together and please enjoy this great week. I look forward to talking to a few of you out on the floor. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take a couple questions. So who's first? Maybe I stunned them. Admiral Brown. Okay, so Admiral Brown asked the question whether we're about testing and what, whether we're trying to accelerate the testing process for command and control, things like that. It's a, uh, uh, I don't want to call it a continual battle because I have a very good relationship with Dr. Mike Gilmore, who's the, the head of uh, operational test and evaluation in the department. Uh, you know, he has very strong feelings, he and his team do, that we have to make sure that we, we test everything that we do very, very rigorously. And of course, those of us more on the operational side want to get this in the hands of the warfighter as quickly as we can. So we, we have a healthy tension there. I can't give you any specifics on, on specific steps we're taking to accelerate command and control, but I know that there's a, a sense in the department that for particularly for um, uh, command and control things, uh, electronics, that sort of thing, that technology advances so fast that we, we have to move it as quickly as we can and we can't waste an awful lot of time getting in our warfighter's hands. But I take your point, something I'll go back and ask, ask when I get back to DC. Good to see you again, Admiral Brown. Another question. Pretty quiet out there. So if I can summarize Admiral Daly's question, it is, uh, are we taking a closer look now at the tension that's there between supply and demand for uh, a very stressed force that's out there and about in the world uh, and um, is, is sort of feeling the pain, and particularly with the budget environment that could be going down? And the answer is very definitely yes. Uh, we are very cognizant of the fact that the COCOM demands very much exceed our ability to supply them and that our, it's in our ethic, it's in our culture, that we always do the very best we can to support the warfighter and get the COCOM everything that, that he can possibly uh, ask for, but we simply can't do that. And it's starting to show up in some real severe stress on the force, not only in our ground forces, but also in our air and naval forces as well. And we are taking a very close look at how we uh, uh, appetite suppress some of the demand signals that are out there. And one of the ways of doing that is to allocate forces along the lines of those six national security interests that I mentioned earlier. Because we find that there are some forces out there in the world today that have been asked for and have been provided to COCOMs that might be servicing a lower level interest rather than a higher level interest. And we're, we're applying that filter to a, a lot of these decisions on a daily basis. We're gonna have to get that under control, particularly as our, our readiness funding comes down. Well, thank you. Um, I think we're gonna cut questions here and allow Admiral Winnefeld to uh, get out on the floor but I want to thank him and uh, thank all our speakers for coming out, but particularly Admiral Winnefeld. It strikes me that uh, a lot of us have things to worry about, and we may think our lives are complicated, but this is a man who has a lot on his plate. So, Admiral, I'd like you to accept this gift of this book from the Naval Institute Press, Naval Institute Book, AFSEA Bookmark.
It's entitled Allied Master Strategist about the combined Chiefs of Staff in World War II. We thank you for your leadership and your service in this important time. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thanks for inviting me out. Thank it's you. been great. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. OK. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the exhibit floor is open. The three theaters on the exhibit floor are about to commence their sessions. Please be sure to stop by the USNI booth, 930, to take advantage of book signings and such, and also the APSEA booth, 1619, to talk membership with APSEA personnel. At 10 a.m., this week's first panel session will begin, and the cyber training track will also begin. Thank you.